All right. They that sit in darkness have seen a great light. One, another great song in Honol's Messiah. Daniel chapter 2. Let's read the passage here. We're going to start in Daniel 2, verse 36. The Bible says, uh, this is the dream. So he had the dream, he interpreted it, and he spared the lives of the wise men. They weren't that wise then, were they? <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't have an answer. That's the world. They really, the world looks up to certain people and they call themselves wise, like Einstein. But he said, I can't believe in a God if he's not a mathematical equation. You can't reduce God down to a laboratory experiment. You're never going to find God in a test tube. You're never going to find God in a mathematical equation. He, he's, he's the one who made math. He created science. You can't find God out through science. You have to believe in him. The Bible says, and without explanation, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God made, created the heaven and the earth. He, he doesn't say, well, how did God start? You don't even ask that. God was eternal. To fi figure out, find out God, you'll never understand God. The Bible says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Uh, you can't figure out God. God became a man. Jews say God couldn't become a man. Why not? God can do anything he wants. Well, the Bible says he can't do something. It says God who cannot lie, he can't lie. But that's, that's one of those, it's telling you God, he can do anything he wants. But God, all things are possible. In fact, uh, he can't tell something and then break his word. He's God. But... You can't figure God out like that. These men were wise, they said, wise men, soothsayers, Chaldeans, but they couldn't give an answer. The world doesn't have an answer. Amen? When you think about it, they don't know what the pro how to solve the problems of this world. They just get worse and worse, and they keep on stealing more money. Daniel chapter 2, these men couldn't answer, but Daniel did. He answered the dream, and now he's going to tell them what it meant. I don't even know if that's what the king required. I think he just said... if. Show me the dream. <clears throat> yeah, he wanted the interpretation. He wanted to figure it out. But he said, if you guys can't tell me the dream, I'm going to kill you. And now he says, this is the interpretation. We will. Now, when he says we, I guess he's concluding the fact that these three other boys, uh, Mishael and Azariah and what's his name? I can't. Hananiah all prayed together and they helped him. And uh, Daniel didn't do it alone. Remember that? He went to them and said, brothers, we got to pray. So we'll, we'll tell you the interpretation and uh, thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. The only other person you find that in the Bible is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the king of kings. And he said, thou art a king of, not the king of kings. <laughs> but on earth, there was never a king as more mighty and powerful. Because this is a, a monarchy that's over other kingdoms. So all the princes of all the other lands would submit, they submitted themselves to Nebuchadnezzar or were subjugated by force by him. He controlled the whole world. But he was a king of kings. So this monarchy was over other monarchies, over Egypt, over Assyria, and they kept them uh, and they paid dues and taxes to the king of Babylon for peace. And he had peace in all his kingdom at that point. He controlled the whole world. There was no more wars. He was in charge for about, their kingdom was about 55 years, 55 years of that. Now, the children of Israel were in bondage for 70 years, but for, uh, it switches hands halfway through there, or a little further, 55 years into it, Babylon is going to fall to Medo Persia. I mean, you think about, like I said, communism lasted 70 years under the, under the communist regime. America is now coming up to what, 250? Uh, what are we at? Yeah, we're going to be close to, well, 1782 was when we became a nation, basically, after the uh, Civil War. I mean, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War. We had, uh, what was that, six years? In, in 1782, we had the, const what is it called, the Constitutional Congress, and then we become a nation. So in 10 years... America will be a quarter of a millennia. That's a pretty long time for most nations. You say we're a young nation. We are somewhat, but compared to the ancient, like how long most nations have been around. But as far as a government, 
250 years running, that's by the grace of God. America hasn't fallen yet. You say, could that happen? It could happen at any time. You say, well, how's that? Look at Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Here he was partying there, his grandson, what was his name, Belteshazzar? Uh, Belshazzar, and he's in his palace, and man, that night, his kingdom was overtaken in a night. He th he, and this is how fast, this is the king of kings, and his kingdom fell overnight. So God will raise up a kingdom, and he can bring down a kingdom. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. It was given to him by God. You never forget that. We have a nation that we, there's, in God we trust. If we quit trusting God as a people, and then we don't, we don't realize it, that God raised up America for his purpose. And he can take America down. It's not up to us. Amen? Our Second Amendment ain't going to keep your country. If you don't believe in God and trust in God and pray to God, your guns aren't going to do a thing. Amen. That's what I, like. I like having my freedom. I like having my gun. But that ain't going to save America if God doesn't save America. And he says, God hath given thee a kingdom power and strength <coughs> and glory and so any nation needs God without God you're not going to have glory Ukrainians say glory to Ukraine all the time I, yeah, I understand what they're saying but I, I'd rather not say glory to Ukraine I'd say glory to God um, that's just uh, on these, I, they say Slava Ukraini and that's like glory to Ukraine but um, it's almost like Viva la France. America says, what do we say? What do we, what's our American saying? God bless America. How about America's number one? I've heard that. We're number one. USA. We, you know, we, we're, we, can, we could be number uh, 175 too if God <laughs> so desires. But glory to God, not glory to any man or any country. Even this king, when he took the glory later on, God humbles him. When he walks around in his kingdom and sees that what he built, God makes him eat grass like a, like a cow, like a, like a beast. And whensoever, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So, um... He begins to describe the, the vision, the dream. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior <coughs> to thee. So it begins to already break down. Inferior. So it's silver. Gold costs about, I don't know, $1,800 an ounce today. Something like that. Maybe less, $1,700. Goes up and down. Silver runs about $20, $22 an ounce. I had a bunch of silver dollars one time and uh, in a Tupperware we had, and silver went up to $45 one time. And I took them all down to the silver guy I knew, and he, he worked out of a basement on, on, in Brooklyn. He was a Jewish guy named Steve. And I brought him a whole bowl of those things. We, I don't know how much we got, probably about $4,500. Um, because each one was worth 45 bucks, and I had about 100 of them. I could get about $2,200 a day. You say, well, that's a good, that is a good investment because money was worth more back 25 years ago. 20, I don't know, was that in the 9, 2000? 22 years ago. So, uh, but the silver dollar went up and it went down to $12. Silver goes up and down. Gold goes up and down. But gold is worth about almost 10 times silver. Maybe not that much, but around that. Um, Silver's not worth anywhere near gold. I guess in a way that the next kingdom would come along was already divided. You got arms of silver. So already it's inferior in that it's a Medio, uh, Medio Persian kingdom. Media and Persia were united to overcome Babylon. And so Media Persian is a two, uh, two, king, uh, two powers united together to become the next kingdom. As gold is much more worth than silver, and it's also weightier than silver. And so uh, you see it, it's, uh, it goes in value downward, and it also goes in weight downward, and it goes in uh, preciousness. It's not as fine, it's not as precious, and it's not as beautiful. 
And so there's something about beauty, there's something about gold. You start out in the Bible, and the Bible talks about the gold in that land where the four rivers came out of Eden, and it says the gold thereof was was it say was good? I can't remember. Let's look here in Genesis chapter. Where's that at? Genesis two, <clears throat> verse ten. And a river went out of Eden to guard, water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. So the Lord's already talking about the gold. There is bdellium and the onyx stone and so forth. And so there was a lot of gold around the Garden of Eden, and it, you know how gold travels through rivers. Here it is in these rivers. And if you want to find gold, you've got to find out where the water flows. And um, so anyways, gold was the first kingdom. You notice also about that image he has, the gold, silver, brass, iron, and feet of iron and clay. It's top-heavy. The kingdoms of this world are not balanced. It's, it's, it's created, it's set up to fail. It's set up to fall. And like we say, it's got ten toes there. And then you're going to see a rock come out. It's going to strike the toes. It's like bowling. Those pins are going to fall. <laughs> the ten toes. Uh, you got a rock and ten toes. That's what you have on a bowling alley. You got ten pins. And uh, the Lord's going to strike it someday. It's going to be a strike. No spares in God's bowling alley. Amen. And all ten pins are going to fall. And this is like a pin. Uh, it's like a bowling pin set up to fall over. Yeah, it's like a lamp or something that's real thin on the on the bottom. I got a, a I got a, a horse and it's and it stands on three legs and the back legs are so close anymore. It dried up. It's made of leather. It barely stands up. You know, if you just the slightest bounce, it falls over. I like it, but it doesn't stand because it's way too, too hot, top heavy for the legs. And um, it's just the way this world is. This world is precarious. People know it. They live on pins and needles because they know that things can change like that. And it will when the Lord comes back. This, the kingdoms of this world are not powerful. They're set up for failure. And that head of gold is too heavy for feet of clay. And that's pride. It's almost like a man walks around with a big head. With top heaviness and not humility. And they're not grounded. The image would have been better if the foundation was gold. And uh, it would be heavy, it would be solid. But the foundation's made of clay. It's like the Lord said, the man that built his house upon the sand and not upon a rock, something solid. And he says, and he's likened unto him that, you know, he that built his house upon the rock is likened unto him that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. But the man that built his house upon the sand was a foolish man. And he uh, was not solid. It was built upon something that was... Um, you know, something weak, something breakable. And so that's what we're seeing here. The whole, this is going to be the, the time of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles start out with God giving a monarchy, king of kings, a king of kings. And it goes down to a, a social democracy, ten kingdoms in Europe. We're seeing that now. It's called uh, social democrats. And what they do is they unite together to make a kingdom, NATO, European Union. United Nations, and they really don't have any strength in that way. So what they're going to do, and we see this in the Bible, they're going to elect a king who will rule over them. And out of these ten kings is going to come one king. That's in Revelation 17. We see this also in Daniel chapter 8 today. We're going to see this. So they're, they're going to go down to a form of government that's fractured. It's not a monarchy, like one king over the world. It's built of kingdoms that band together. So you see this thing go from one to two to four. No, I'm just anatomy-wise. The Greek kingdom had four. It broke up into four. Two continued. Now, a man has bodily parts that are two that, uh, other parts, you know, uh, that come down from a man. Everybody has seven extensions from their body. A woman has two breasts, two arms, two legs, and a head. That's seven. A man also has two sexual organ parts that come out of a body. It's like limbs on a tree. God made everybody with sevens. Male is seven, woman's seven. 
your head has seven holes in it. Not like a bowling ball. You got seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's how God made everything. Sevens. Uh, sevens. And so your body has seven extensions from the trunk. And of this, of this uh, belly of brass, it goes in down into the thighs. And it's four parts. Two of those generals of Alexander the Great, we're going to study this in a second, continued all the way down into the Roman legs. And two of them ended quickly. And so uh, the legs go all the way down. Roman Empire, the legs of iron. And they extend the longest in history. And they end up becoming part of the toes. So what we're going to see is a revived Roman Empire in the last days. European under Papa, Papa Pepperoni out of Italy. You know, you know, you know Mamma Mia, we got the Papa from the Rome. You know, before it was... What was the name? The Polish one. Carol Wyatola. He was an actor. Then we had Ratzinger. What a name, man. Uh, yeah, a good name for a pope. They always change their names, though. They, they take on Pope John Paul XXIII. You know. You say, you might make fun of the popes. They're, they're characters. They're actors. They're, they don't represent Jesus Christ. They say they're the vicar of Christ. You know what the vicar of Christ means? Christ in the flesh on the earth. He speaks through me. Ex cathedra. That's what every pope claims to speak. Ex cathedra. The word of God comes from the pope's mouth. And he decides between tradition and the scriptures what is truth. No thanks. I got the truth right here. Amen. The pope's not the final authority. And the church tries to set the pope up as the leader, the shepherd of all the church. That ain't in the Bible. Peter wasn't the, the answer to everybody. You have local churches with pastors in the Bible. And uh, the vicar of Christ, the mouthpiece of God, the ex-cathedra, and everybody in the world worships him. I'd like to hear one time where he ever preached, you're saved by grace through the gift of God, and tell people how they can be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ alone and not by works. There, you to find some recording of any pope in history that tells you you can be saved by the blood of of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Without that, there's no way to be saved. No, that's not what they believe. If they're going to be honest, they believe in the sacraments. They believe in atoning for your sins through going through the seven sacraments. Anyways, the Roman Empire is likened to that, the mother of abominations in Revelation 17. It's a funny thing that the Catholic Church uh, says Peter was in Babylon... And they say Babylon is Rome themselves. <laughs> How many ever heard that? Anybody? Okay, we got one Catholic here. Ex-Catholic. But they say Peter was in Babylon, so uh, that means he was in Rome. That's an interesting confession. Dina? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they say Peter was buried. Well, that's why they built what's called the, uh, the Sistine Chapel there in the Vatican. They wanted to house the bones of Peter and Paul. And that's a whole other story. But what they did was they borrowed money from the Germans, the bankers called the Fugers of Germany, to build this building, the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And they said that we have the bones of Peter and Paul buried under this church. So we need to build a, a beautiful sarcophagus, a domed ceiling and protect their bones and protect their bodies. And to do that, they started a system called to pay the bankers back. They said, how are we going to pay them back? We will start a system called indulgences. People can pay for their loved ones to get out of purgatory. So they sent a man to Germany called John Eck, E.K., E-C-K, either spelling. And he went throughout Germany collecting money from the poor beggars and the princes and everybody and selling them a slip of paper, depending on who they were, to get their grandmother, their uncle, their aunt, their mother, father, brother, sister, out of purgatory. And he had a little, little catchy motto, something like, as soon as the money in the cup doth clink, that soul, oh, no, as soon as the coin in the cup doth ring, that soul from purgatory doth spring. 
And so people paid to get all their loved ones out of purgatory, and they co- accumulated all this German wealth and paid back the German fugers. And then so Martin Luther, of course, a monk, went down to see Peter's bones and Paul's bones, and he went to the holy city, Rome. And the closer he got, the more debauchery, prostitution, I mean, with the priests. The priests were wicked. He said he went there and couldn't believe the holy city was so wicked. And he came back disillusioned with his religion, Roman Catholicism. And that's how he started the Reformation. He was, he was, uh, he was upset. He said, what? And he started reading the Bible. And what did he find? The just shall live by faith. Amen? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And as a Roman Catholic, I was raised, you got to be good, keep the Ten Commandments, do your, you know, keep the sacraments and be a good person. They believe a mortal sin, a mortal sin is the claim that you know you're going to heaven when you die. How many of you know you're going to heaven when you die? Raise your hand. Amen. That's a sin to the Catholic Church. It's called the sin of presumption. And they refuse to believe, they resist that. And they teach you can't know. Well, how do I get on that? We're talking about the Roman legs. The Roman system has been going on for thousands of years. So when you see this head, it's very short, lived. And then the silver, the arms and the breast. Then the Grecian, the brass. And then these long legs, which expand stand from the days of Christ throughout the church age all the way down to our times of the ten toes. So Rome took power shortly, I, I'm not sure the date, before Christ. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, I uh, haven't really thought about the date. I know Alexander the Greek Empire lasted some time, but eventually it broke up. And there's a series of, we'll see that in, later in Daniel, we'll get into the dates later. But what you're going to see is uh, Cassandra, Cassander, not Cassandra, but Cassander, uh, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Antioch, uh, Antiochus. Those are the four generals of Alexander the Great. And when he died, and he died in 10 years. He, he began to conquer in 333 A.D., and he went, he stormed through Palestine, through India, all the way down to India, took over the world, took over the Babylonian, the Medo Persian, came like a goat, like the Bible says, like a he goat, slamming over to the east from the west. His father, um, Philip, united the Macedonian kingdom. He's called Philip of Macedonia. And he united the, what do you call them? He united the the municipalities, all the different groups of the Greek islands, and united his front in his kingdom. And he gave this power to his son Alexander, who they call Alexander the Great. This man went through there, a young man, 333, Battle of Isis, north of Antioch, through Turkey, all the way to India. They say he died of syphilis about 323 AD. And what happened was now his, he's dead, his generals divided up his kingdom, the Egypt, Palestine, Greece, and uh, over towards the, what you call the Arabic nations, Iran, Iraq. So it was splintered. And that's why you see in the human man, uh, the four parts going down from the waist. It's the Greek, Alexander starts out one solid kingdom, but then he splits. That's a phenomenal thing when you think about it. How that God said, here's the vision. That's why men try to say that Daniel wrote the book. He didn't write the book. It was some Jewish uh, scholar, some Jewish scribe who wrote it around, uh, oh, I forget what date they put it, 237 B.C. And not back here at uh, 533 or 5, uh, excuse me, 5. 55 or somewhere around there, wherever Nebuchadnezzar's already around, what, 605? He's writing this stuff all through that time. Five, 605 to 555. Daniel's writing the book. And he's telling you 
the details God revealed of the coming kingdoms for the next two and a half thousand years. And it comes to pass. Nebuchadnezzar, Medo-Persia, two kingdoms, arms, left and right, east and west. Grecian kingdoms split up into four. Two of them, the Ptolemy and the Antiochus kingdoms, continuing to absorb the other two generals. And they continue to this day. And now you have an east and west church. When you look at the schism of 1034, I mean, you have the, the Greek Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And they control the Russian, European, American, all those things continuing down to the ten toes. It's a fascinating thing. That's what we're looking at right now. Verse 39. Let's go back to Daniel 3, verse 39. Chapter 2, excuse me. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. That's the silver. And that is the Medo-Persian kingdom. And another third kingdom of brass. That's Alexander the Great, the Grecian kingdom. That will take you to the waist and the thighs. See how it's a transition? He says the belly... He's going to say it's the belly of thigh, uh, belly and thighs, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And that will take you down to the Roman kingdom, verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. So there's some things about it. Brass is judgment in the Bible. Brass is judgment. Alexander was, I guess, a judge, very judging. God judged the nations, humbled them. And then the next one's strong, Roman. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, a rod of iron. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Probably the most bloodiest period of time is under Roman, Roman history. When you think about the united papal, secular pa papacy ruling over men along with the European powers. Read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read Martyr's Mirror. How many... People were put to death by the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. That, it was a secular religion that ruled the world through threat, bloodshed, blackmail, and imprisonment, extortion. Verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, so the iron trickles down to the toes, it's part two things. Part of potter's clay and part of iron. So the, the, this kingdom here, the fourth kingdom, runs into the fifth kingdom. It's a revived kingdom. And that's why we call it the revived Holy Roman Empire. It's going to be Europe again. That's the location. It's going to be Rome again. It's going to be France, Spain, Germany. And they're going to have a mixture, though. They're gonna, it's a strange thing. They're going to be mixed with clay. And now here's one of the odd things in the Bible. This is an interesting thing you're going to see here. Keep in mind, what's the book Lord say? As it was in the days of Noah. What's it say next? So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What does that mean? Well, what is the first salient thing that was happening in the days of Noah that really sticks out? Salient means outstanding, prominent. Can't miss it, like the nose on, well, you can't see your nose too well, but like the nose on your face. Can anybody say, what was going on in the days of Noah that God made remark of? Well, hold on. Anybody? Come on, you all know the answer. Joel? What did God say was really strange going on in the days of Noah? First thing that's mentioned. There you go. Women and angels. <laughs> that's the thing that was perverse. More than anything, the Bible says, and it says, in the, and when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they chose them wives. When we know the sons of God are angels throughout all scripture. You look at Job chapter one, the sons of God rejoiced when God laid the foundation. The sons of God are not the godly line of Seth. If it was just the godly line of Seth, explain to me why the next verse says there were giants in the land in those days, men of renown. As a result of the, daughter, the sons of God coming in unto the daughters of men. Let's go back there. Look at it. We're going to try to 
get through this chapter today, wrap up, but there's some things coming. The Bible prophesies right here, right in the midst of this kind of like, okay, matter of fact, that metal man, you got a metal man here, gold, silver, brass, iron, and then you get down to this iron mixed with miry clay. Well, look in Genesis 6, and it came to pass, what was going on in the days of Noah? Because Jesus said it's going to be the same thing. Men were eating, drinking, and giving in marriage until the wrath of God smacked them. And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them on the earth. This is what's going on on earth. Now, someone's observing this from afar. It ain't the same group. Verse 2 is not the same group. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men. It's segregating that verse from the first one. Those people are not the same class or the same group or the same people. Read the, you got to understand English, it's real simple. And verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men from afar, that they were fair. And what they do? They left Jude. Jude says, let's go back, keep your finger here, go to Jude. Say, so why are we talking about this? You'll see in a minute. Go to Jude. Look at, look at verse 5. I will, put, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. All right, now what's the example of some people that didn't believe in God and didn't do what he said to do? He's going to use angel, angels. This is not Satan and the first angels that fell. This is a subsequent group of angels that fall later when they're tempted by looking at women. He says, and the angels which kept not their first estate. What is their first estate? In heaven, on the third heaven with God. They left that place, their estate. They left their land, but left their own habitation. How can that be the sons of Seth or the godly line of Seth? They left their habit, own habitation, and the, let's read, read what it says. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. I'll give you an example. What did those men of Sodom want whenever they went to Lot's house? Did they want his daughters? They wanted them angels. <laughs> they said, send those men. We want those angels to come out. They're pure. And they wanted to sleep with those angels. There's some wild stuff here. The angels that left their first estate, he says, and going after strange flesh and are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. The devil's always been interested in human bodies and trying to be in them. All When Christ was on earth, there were devils filling people all the time, and the devil's going to bring an antichrist into this world someday through cohabitation with a human woman. That's who the antichrist is. Even Christ said to Judas Iscariot, Haven't I, haven't I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Do some Bible study. There's some wild stuff going on in this world and in this Bible, and it's going to come to pass very shortly. It's going to happen again. Go back to Genesis 6. And it says here, and the Lord uh, was angry with it. And it says, And the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. People knew about them, but they were not pleasing to God. They were some hybrid birth from men and angels. So let's go back to Daniel. You say, will that happen again? Yeah, the Lord said it will. And so Daniel gives us a little glimpse into it. Why? He says it right here. Look at the details of this verse, chapter 2. And now we're down into the ten kings, the Antichrist kingdom. We're going to see this three or four times in the book of Daniel, where he's going to see a, a, a dreadful beast over in chapter 8. And it has iron teeth. 
and it has ten horns. That's the ten toes. And he talks about one of those horns growing up, and, it, and it's going to be the Antichrist out of the ten kings of Europe. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And here's the verse. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it. <laughs> Somebody's mingling with the seed of men again. And it ain't men because it says they. Right there under your nose, right in the Bible. The Bible's telling you there's some kind. That's why men are always looking for some kind of uh, alien invasion. To come down. I remember when Twilight Zone, they had one where the angels, not angels, they had aliens come down and Finally, the guy figured it out. You know, the aliens were taking people, and he deciphered the book they had. And he yells as the people are getting on, it's a cookbook. <laughs> they were herding people and taking them back and eating them, you know. They were like cows. That was one of my favorite episodes. It's a cookbook. They thought it was a book for peace, and they were, like, trying to decipher the book, and finally the guy got it deciphered. Um, you'll see that a lot. People want to believe there's aliens out there, and one day we're going to cohabitate with them. They will. Except it's not... It's not aliens like they think. It's the prince of the power of the air. And there's going to be the, this cohabitation again in the days of the tribulation and demonic activity like never uh, seen on earth, even in the days of Noah. There's never been a more wicked time than what's coming on this world when Christ destroys this world with Armageddon because of this activity. The stuff's already preparing now. There's some wicked stuff going on in satanic stuff going on in this world that would blow your mind. You say, well, that all sounds too fantastic. I believe my Bible. It's fantastic. It is. It's wild. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. This is what we're talking about. But they, sh they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. It's still two different creations, angels and men. But they can have some kind of a seed. The Antichrist will be the result of some woman cohabitating with Satan. And he will be part of the satanic trinity. He's called the son of perdition. And he goes to his own place in Abaddon, in a pit. And he'll die. He'll be killed in the tribulation. And he will come back to life by the power of the false prophet. This is all in the Bible. So the Antichrist, when he comes, he's going to be killed. He's going to be put to death. Yet he's going to be raised from the dead and the world's going to say, that's Christ. And they're going to worship him and take his mark. And in these days, the kings shall set the... And in, these, in the days of these kings, that's the ten toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So that means he's coming back to destroy those ten toes, which shall never be destroyed. That's Christ's kingdom, the millennium. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So it's never going to be overthrown. And he shall reign forever and ever. And he shall, amen? <laughs> that's what that's about. He's going to reign forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone, that's Christ, all through the scriptures, the stone that followed them, the rock that followed them, Christ is that precious cornerstone. The stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. That's the Father. And that, that phrase is seen throughout Scripture several times. We have a circumcision made without hands. So that means it's the work of God. It was the Father who put the seed in the woman. And uh, man didn't have a hand in that. It's God's seed came into this world. It was God who raised the Son from the dead. And it was God who gave you a spiritual circumcision. You're baptized into the Spirit, into the body by the Holy Spirit without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron going backward now. Well, it's mixed up. The iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold. Now, I don't know why the clay is put in the middle there like that. Pretty interesting. I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the heart of man. The silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Well, that's it. I mean, uh, there's the image. We got Nebuchadnezzar. We have the kings of Middle Persia. We got Alexander the Great. We got the 
Caesars and the Roman kingdom, and then we have the Antichrist ten toes. That's what we see in the, the vision here. We're looking backward at it now, and we can see that it's going to topple. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel, and nowhere does Daniel say stand up. That's where his big mistake in this book is. Whenever John fell down in the book of Revelation before the angel, the angel says, stand up, I'm one of your brethren. Daniel should have said that here. I don't see him saying it. I think it would have remarked it if he, if he uh, had done that. It was, should have been remarked. In, the Lord usually remarks it in Scripture. I might be wrong, but nothing said about Daniel saying, stand up, as a, I, am, I am just a, a, a humble servant, I am nobody. Even like he started to say in the beginning of the dream, he said uh, that this wasn't revealed to me for anything I have done. Uh, what verse is that? Um, verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king, but there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. Uh, where does he say, not because of me? Uh, verse 30, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. He started out humble. Reminds me of Saul when he hid himself among the stuff. He was small, he was uh, humble, he was little in his own eyes, but later on he got proud. God reveals things to you, and people say, oh, you're smart, you're so wise, you know so much Bible. Watch out. That could be a trip track. That could be a, a, a snare of the devil to get you proud. Stay humble. If you know anything from the Bible, it's revealed to you by God, and it had nothing to do with you. And Daniel here kind of maybe he liked that. Well, man, I got the king of all the earth. I just preached to him that you're thou art a king of kings, and God hath put all this in your hand, and now you're bowing down to me. Whew, that must feel pretty good. And Daniel but didn't say nothing about it. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many gifts. The Bible warns you to beware of gifts. And made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king and he set up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So that was a prominent place, like a throne. And people would come to him like Absalom had that place too. And he was able to steal the hearts of the people away from David as he sat in the gate. It's a prominent place. So as we wrap up here, stay humble. Study your Bible. It's good to have knowledge, but the Bible says knowledge puffeth up, charity edifieth. 